Hi again, Genetic Innovation students. In this lecture, we will continue discussing DNA sequencing and we will focus on next generation sequencing. In the previous lecture, we looked at a table where we differentiated between Sanger sequencing and next generation sequencing. And we're now going to describe the bridge amplification method that is used in next generation sequencing. So as you can see, we concluded the previous lecture on this slide. And now let's move on to discuss next generation sequencing. We'll begin by discussing how DNA is prepared for next generation sequencing. Firstly, different companies have developed different platforms or methods for next generation sequencing. And some of this information does tend to be protected by a proprietary copyright. However, all methods must begin with the preparation of a DNA library. The DNA library preparation involves isolation of DNA or DNA of interest. So depending on where we want to sequence the DNA from, the organism, DNA is first isolated from our source that we are interested in sequencing. Total DNA is then fragmented or cleaved into tiny pieces of appropriate length, depending on the sequencing platform that is to be used. DNA can be fragmented into small pieces using a process called sonication. Sonication involves the use of sound energy to mechanically shear DNA in an aqueous solution. And this occurs due to hydrodynamic shearing forces, which break the DNA at random locations. So you have DNA that has been extracted, a whole bunch of DNA from a particular organism. The DNA is then sonicated into smaller fragments. For example, in the Illumina platform, you'd have approximately 100 base pair fragments. And these fragments can be sheared at random locations. So because they are sheared using hydrodynamic shearing forces, what may occur is that we have five prime and three prime overhangs. So when we have these overhangs, these overhangs must first be converted to blunt ends. And this is achieved using a polymerase as well as an exonuclease. So the exonuclease can cleave three prime overhangs in a three to five prime direction, whereas a polymerase can add bases in the five to three prime direction to fill in the missing bases at the five prime overhang. So this process is called blunting. And these blunted fragments are then phosphorylated at the 5' prime end and A-tailed at the 3' prime end. So we have a phos phospho group added to the 5' prime end and an adenine residue added to the 3' prime end. The reason we add an A-tail or single A base to the 3' prime end is because this facilitates ligation with an adapter because the adapter contains a T overhang. The adapter then serves as a binding site for primers during the sequencing reaction. So this diagram summarizes what I've just discussed in the previous slide. For sample preparation, we sonicate our DNA fragment of interest. Nebulization is another method that can be used to shear DNA. We then end up with DNA that may contain these overhangs, five or three prime overhangs. And we have a polymerase that can fill in the missing bases at the five prime overhang. So here we have our five prime overhang and we have a polymerase coming in and filling the missing complementary bases. Or we have an exonuclease that will cleave the three prime overhangs. So what happens is we end up with these blunt ends. These blunted fragments are then phosphorylated at the five prime end and an A residue is added to the three prime end. And here we have our oligonucleotide. So this is a Y-shaped oligonucleotide. And the reason they are Y-shaped is because they have some region of complementarity here, whereas these two ends are 
are no longer complementary. So the Y oligonucleotides contain one short region that is complementary to each other and the remaining parts are not complementary to each other. And then we have a T overhang here and those T overhangs, the three prime T overhangs, can bind to the A overhang. So here in part B, we have our DNA fragments, which have the A overhangs, as you can see. And now we have ligation of our DNA fragment with the oligos on either end or the adapters on either end. And these are then amplified using primers that are specific to the oligos. So we have a primer binding to oligo number one, as you can see here, or a primer binding to oligo number two, and these fragments are amplified. What we can do after this in the first round of DNA synthesis is to amplify just a single side. So we will amplify using just one primer. So we have primer number one that's amplifying all the sequences. So Primer number one binds, but not primer number two. And we'll learn why this is important when we discuss the Illumina platform later on. So we have binding of just primer one during the first round of amplification. And these form double-stranded DNA. Once we have double-stranded DNA, or we've amplified our DNA of interest from one primer, we can then start amplifying the desired products and sequencing during the sequencing reaction using both primer number one and primer number two. So let's just discuss this process again. Once the oligonucleotides are ligated to the ends of each fragment, the fragments are amplified. There are two methods that can be used to amplify the DNA fragment. So the first step is amplification of the DNA fragments. So when we talk about amplification of DNA fragments, we also call this cluster generation because each of the various DNA fragments um, that have been ligated to an adapter are amplified. There are two methods that are used for amplification. The first is emulsion PCR. Emulsion PCR is a technique that was first developed by Applied Bio Systems in the ABI solid platform for DNA sequencing. Emulsion PCR involves separation of the DNA fragments in a mixture of oil and water. So a mixture of oil and water can be called an emulsion. An aqueous solution that contains the PCR master mix DNTPs and DNA are all mixed. So the aqueous solution is the solution in water, and this whole solution is mixed with the oil. This ends up forming tiny little droplets. So in the solution, we have our DNTPs, our master mix for replicating those fragments of DNA, as well as the sheared DNA of interest. It then forms these tiny droplets that are so small that each droplet just contains one fragment of the sheared DNA. And it will also contain master mix and DNTPs in each of these droplets. These droplets, each containing one DNA fragment, can then be amplified. So each DNA fragment that's present in that droplet is then amplified in a micro reactor. Now, as I mentioned, we'll be focusing on the bridge amplification method. The second method for amplification of a DNA fragment is bridge amplification. And this method is used by the Illumina sequencing platform. The Illumina sequencing platform involves a two-dimensional PCR of DNA fragments. And these DNA fragments are separated and bound to a glass slide, which is contained within a flow cell. Now let's discuss how bridge amplification works in some more detail. Now, as I mentioned before, these forked adapters 
are ligated to our DNA fragments of interest. And let's look at how this is used in the Illumina platform. So this part here represents the Illumina flow cell. And the Illumina flow cell contains two types of single-stranded oligonucleotides. So these oligos, the single-stranded oligos are represented by these red bars and these blue bars. And these oligos or these single-stranded DNA oligos are tethered or bound to the flow cell at their five prime ends by a short flexible linker, which is shown here in black. So each of these linkers can bind to the adapters that were fixed to the ends of the DNA fragments. So here we have four different DNA fragments and they each have a adapter. And depending on whether it was adapter number one or adapter number two, it will bind to one of these linkers. So let's discuss this flow cell in some more detail. As you can see, we have a flow cell here. Now the DNA fragments that are to be sequenced are passed through this flow cell at a very low concentration. So by creating a very low concentration or diluting that DNA sample that we want to sequence and then passing it through a flow cell, each of these fragments are bound to the flow cell at the complementary oligo at distant regions. So they are quite far from each other. So what happens is we have good separation between each fragment of DNA. So now we have our DNA fragments tethered to the flow cell at the oligonucleotides. And once this is done, the first round of DNA synthesis begins. So we'll start with just a single primer and we will amplify those fragments that are only bound to linker number one. So we'll start with an amplification. So during the first round of amplification, we start amplifying from this complementary linker region. So as you can see here, the DNA that was originally bound due to complementarity is there. And now we're synthesizing the complementary strand that is covalently bound to the oligo that is tethered to the flow cell. Now, once this occurs, once we have PCR and we've amplified this fragment, we will then denature this DNA, wash off the complementary basis. Once it's denatured and washed off, the strand that's remaining will be the strand that has been covalently bound to the linker region. So these single-stranded DNA fragments that are remaining are then bent. So a procedure that involves bending of the DNA fragment is applied. So now what happens is that DNA, because this is single-stranded DNA, um, that is complementary to primer number two or oligo number two shown in blue, will then bend over and bind to the corresponding fragment or um, oligonucleotide. DNA is then amplified using primer number two. So now we can see amplification going in the opposite direction from primer number two. Following this, DNA is denatured again. And now what we have is that same DNA fragment or two copies of that DNA fragment very closely associated to each other. And this whole procedure can be repeated now using both primers. And successive rounds of denaturation and amplification leads to multiple different copies of the same DNA fragment located at one specific region on this flow cell. So if we go to part C of this diagram here, we can see where sequence number one, two, and three, and four were originally located on the flow cell. Through these successive rounds of DNA synthesis denaturation, we now have multiple clusters of the exact same DNA fragment located or clustered at specific regions on this flow cell because as they bend and amplify, they will bind to the oligos that are very closely located because these DNA fragments are very short in length. And so what happens is we have these clusters of DNA fragments. So the flow cell now has these clusters of DNA fragments and these DNA fragments can then be 
sequenced. So the sequencing reaction occurs in a similar way to Sanger sequencing. However, instead of sequencing at the end point of the reaction, the signal that's emitted from the DNA bases can be measured one base pair at a time. So here we have our DNA sequences in each cluster. So during the sequencing reaction, what we have is amplification from one primer at a time during each reaction. So say we were to use primer number one, at the end of each base being added, the signal is detected. So when bases are added one nucleotide at a time, we have a nucleotide added. It then emits a signal or fluorescent signal. That signal is captured and then the next nucleotide is added. When the next nucleotide is added, the signal is captured or photograph is taken and then the next nucleotide is added. So after each one base is added, a picture is taken. And if we look at a flow cell here, for example, we have a picture of each cluster. And as you can see, each of these dots represents one cluster of DNA. And so what happens is every time a signal is emitted after one base is added, we have a picture of all of these dots. And these pictures can be layered or stacked one on top of the other. And we can then determine the sequence of each of these fragments of DNA present on this flow cell. So during next-gen sequencing, the flow cell is a sealed glass device that will allow the reagents to pass through over the flow cell. So it's sealed except for one opening on each end that allows reagents to pass through. And this is passed through a glass channel over this flow cell. The sequence is recorded during DNA synthesis of the complementary base. So each of these flow cells containing a DNA fragment of interest or single-stranded DNA is amplified. And during the amplification, as each complementary base is added, the signal is measured. In next-gen sequencing, dideoxynucleotides are not used. And each DNTP is labeled and emits a light signal. Although we are not discussing the ABI solid system in detail, the ABI solid system uses a technique called pyrosequencing, and this involves the release of a pyrophosphate every time a base is incorporated. In terms of the Illumina system, the signal is recorded using a CCD camera or an electrical signal after each nucleotide is added. So these are the basics of how next generation sequencing works and there are some other materials that you may refer to in order to supplement your knowledge after this lecture. Thank you.